tonight, which is going to be really, really interesting, and then the next, we're going to skip on uh, the week of 4th of July, and the next uh, lecture will be on uh, July 11th, so, which will be here also, with, with who is, uh, we will uh, have uh, uh, Dr. Kelly Jones, who's uh, from the, uh, Arkansas Tech at, uh, at Russellville, and she she has a very interesting presentation for us as well, so I hope you'll come to that one as well. I'm not going to talk very long here. Pat, Pat will tell you that she's lucky she got me to talk at all, because she, she, knows, she knows I don't like this. Um, I'm really pleased to, to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Sharice Jones Branch. Um, she is the Dean of Graduate School and Professor of History at Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. Uh, native of Charleston, South Carolina. She received her BA and MA there from the College of Charleston and a doctorate in history from Ohio State University. I guess I'm supposed to say the Ohio State University. <laughs> um, Dr. Jones Branch is the author of, uh, of uh, several works, um, Crossing the Line, Women and Interracial Activism in South Carolina during and after World War II. Uh, she's also the co-editor of Arkansas Women, Their Lives and Times. And she's co-editor of a brand new, I think, series at uh, University of Arkansas Press, R R Rural Black Studies. Okay, and uh, her book, Better Living by, the, by Their Own Art... Let me say this. You have really long titles. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's right, that's right. Better Living by Their Own Bootstraps, Black Women Activism in Rural Arkansas, 1913. 1965. You'll see it there. Um, that, that is, that's her current book is available from University of Arkansas Press, and this is what she'll be speaking about tonight. So I'll also mention that Dr. Jones Branch is currently working on a third book project titled To Make the Farm Bureau Stronger and Better for All People, African Americans and the American Farm Bureau Federation. Um, so uh, maybe Maybe next summer we'll have her back to talk about be ready <laughs> not, not ready yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, please give us a, a warm Pocahontas welcome for Dr. Sharice Jones Branch. Thank you so very much. I hope everyone is doing okay this evening. Um, I hope I'm grateful for the relatively cooler weather. I hope you are too. We've only got that for a few days. Um, if there's any consolation to you at all, I just returned from uh, giving a talk in Sweden a few <coughs> days ago where the weather was a little bit cooler, um, not much, and they don't like air conditioning as much as we do. So that was, that was really interesting, but my sister and I survived. So I'm, I'm really glad to be with you today. Thank you, Ms. Mary. Thank you, Ms. Pat, for inviting me to come to the Edie Mae Heron Center. I, I always like to have an opportunity to come here and, and talk to folks and just be in the space that has so much rich and invaluable history. And, and I'm, I'm deeply honored uh, to be able to talk about my book, Better Living by Their Own Bootstraps, Black Women's Activism, in rural Arkansas, 1914 to 1965. Um, and as Mary mentioned in my introduction, I am a native of Charleston, South Carolina, but I have been living here for going on 20 years now. And a couple of years ago, uh, Guy Lancaster, who edits the Arkansas Encyclopedia, actually sent me an official Arkansas certificate. <laughs> so I think I'm, I'm legit now. I have a certificate. I keep it in my office. Um, yes. So I, I, I think I'm, I'm official now. So I just want to I just want to tell you a little bit about how I started working on this book a few years ago. It I when I started looking at what became my book, my first thought was that this was only going to be a conference paper. I had learned about home demonstration agents when I was working on my first book because there was a woman in that book who was named Sarah Daniels, uh, an African-American woman 
and she was a home demonstration agent in South Carolina. Uh, she was employed by the South Carolina Cooperative Agricultural Cooperative Extension Service, and she was fired from her job because of her civil rights activism. Now, I didn't know what a home demonstration agent was. I hadn't had much interaction with the Extension Service at all. It always existed. I just didn't know anything about it. I don't come from a rural background, so it didn't occur to me to really look into what that was. And then it kept nagging me, um, and, it, and it kept reeling in the back of my mind, and I said, I need to know what these women did and who, and who they were. And so I started nosing around in some information here in Arkansas, and somebody told me, well, you know, there were black and white home demonstration agents, and they all did the same thing. And I said, that, that, that dog doesn't hunt for me, because <laughs> we're talking about the rural Jim Crow South, which means that they experience very different realities, even existing in the same space. And so I needed to know more about what that meant. I was also told that, well, they didn't really engage in any sort of activism. They talked about uh, canning tomatoes and corn and meat and things like that. And I've said this many, many times, canning tomatoes ain't all that interesting. So <laughs> what other conversations are, are happening in the midst of canning corn, canning tomatoes, so on and so forth. These, these are intelligent people, right? Rurality does not equal um, ignorance. These are smart people. So what other conversations are they having in those spaces? How are they understanding and navigating their spaces? And so I started doing some nosing around. And I started by presenting a paper on black home demonstration agents um, at a little mini conference at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock, a few years ago. And as I said, I really thought that was going to be it. Got this conference paper, I got 10 pages out of it. Let's, you know, let's just move on to something else. But I wanted to know more, and I started digging. And when I started doing that, I uncovered this really rich world of rural activism, rural civil rights activism, rural activism around things like health, food insecurity, housing insecurity, so on and so forth. It's just all of these things that nobody had uh, ever bothered to, to, to talk about or to write about. And so I started thinking that this was going to be something bigger than just a conference paper. But where do I find the sources? Where do I find the scholarship uh, that talks about all of this? And as it turns out, there was no such animal for African American home demonstration agents or African American extension service workers. Uh, all of my first examples, frameworks for what later became my book, came from what my white colleagues had written between you know, the United States, Canada, um, I've got colleagues in Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, all these places who write about rural women. And so I said, well, I've got to look at what they've written and I've got to figure out how I can make that work for what I want to say about African American women activists in this rural space. So here we go. So this, as you know, is a map of Arkansas, particularly the Arkansas Delta. Most of the women I talk about in my book come from this part of the state, although not all of them do. I chronicle at least one woman, and I'll mention her a little bit later, uh, who lived in, in southwest Arkansas. And in the book, I even talk about an African-American woman who lived her entire life in Fort Smith, Arkansas, although she was originally from New York. Um, so just these very interesting um, stories about these women. Um, and I also want to list some of the topics that will come up as I speak this evening. This is the map of Arkansas. You know that. But here are some of the things that I want to talk about this evening. Uh, the smith Lever Act. Um, the United States Agricultural Cooperative Extension Service, the Arkansas Extension Service, Home Demonstration Agents and Clubs, 1919 Elaine uh, Massacre, the Southern Senate Farmers Union, Super Gene Supervising Industrial Teachers, the Arkansas Association of Colored Women. And then I'm going to end by talking about the truly unique individual, Mrs. Annie Zachary Pike. But let me start with talking about the smith Lever Act, uh, the 1914 smith Lever Act in the Extension Service. So, and you may already be aware of this, um, I like to always think that my audiences are very smart people. Um, but this act led to the creation of the United States Department of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service, which placed farm and home demonstration work across the nation under the direction of the federal government. And farm and home agents, and if you were ever part of the 4-H or part of a home demonstration club, you already knew all of this, 
uh, they were deemed necessary to help rural people, regardless of race, implement new skills and technologies to improve farm life. So part of their job was to help introduce new technologies, new science, new implements, new whatever, to make farm life better. And the Arkansas Agricultural Cooperative Extension Service was founded shortly after the passage of the Smith-Lever Act. However, due to Jim Crow laws, and we've all heard about those, the Extension Service was segregated. So if you think about Arkansas, the Extension Service's headquarters were at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, but for African Americans, the headquarters was at Arkansas Agricultural Mechanical um, and Normal Institute, now known today as UAPB, uh, down in, in Pine Bluff. So they, they were segregated from um, its inception. Okay? Um, home demonstration agents, all of whom were women, were tasked with helping rural people, and particularly rural women, improve farm family life and farm mm -hmm. homes. They're also expected to help form, form home demonstration clubs. But this is a little more complicated <coughs> for African American women because their lives are complicated by deeply entrenched rural racism, segregated, segregation rather, and unequal access to resources. So what do I mean by that? If you were to look at some newspapers from way back in the day, the quorum courts typically pay the salaries for extension service agents. And I promise you I'm going to get to some really neat images in a minute. Um, but if you looked at the quorum court, and I'm just going to give you an example here, if a white home demonstration agent earned, I don't know, let's say $1,500 a year, the black agent only earned $500, right? So there were gross disparities in terms of pay, access to resources, uh, so on and so forth. Okay? Um, they're also not trusted, particularly in areas where you have large populations of African American rural laborers, because white landowners don't want these folks coming onto their property and teaching them newfangled ideas or, or teaching them to, to think beyond their station. To, they they want to maintain control over these people. So when you first come into these spaces, they don't trust you. They, they want to know what your end game is. They want to know what you're going to talk to these people um, about. Um, they don't want anybody to come in and dislodge the political and economic control they held over their black labor force. But I want to be clear about this. I mean, when I give these kinds of talks about this book, I always tell people that I'm not in the business of just writing about black oppression. I also write and talk about black power and agency and autonomy, right? The ways in which people could look at a situation and cleverly discern um, moments of opportunity, right? And so that's a lot of what I want to talk about here. And yes, many of these people are very poor, and I want, I want to be clear about that as well. Just because you're black living in a rural space does not necessarily mean that you are poor. Some of these people are landowners, right? And I'll give you a couple of examples, and, and, well, at least one very good example um, of that. Um, but they, they are dealing with some limitations uh, due to racism and unequal resources. But what black home demonstration agents and other black women activists in these rural spaces were able to do is that they can manipulate their connections to people, leverage their connections to the local community to get the resources they need to help these rural uh, black communities. Now I want to first start, as I said, by talking about home demonstration <coughs> agents. And the first black home demonstration agent in Arkansas is a woman named Mary L. Ray. And as I say here, she is on the far left. She was hired in 1918. She was working at Langston University in Oklahoma. Langston still exists to this day. It's a historically black institution. She was working, in fact, she headed the home economics department at Langston, uh, Langston University. And she married Harvey Cincinnatus Ray, who was the first African-American farm agent in Arkansas. So she moves to Arkansas in 1920, uh, 1918 rather, and by 1920, she is responsible for all of the black home demonstration aides in the Arkansas Delta. But again, these women have to be very smart about how they move through these spaces because she understood that in order to help rural African Americans, she had to navigate her relationship with local whites. 
because they are the ones who had the keys to the kingdom, who had access to the resources that she needed to help folks in, in these communities. They were the <coughs> ones who determined how much information and resources she had to help extend extension programs. But I also argue that these black agents engage in what we could call stealth activism, right? Because their very presence as professional, educated men and women, women in particular, demonstrated to rural African Americans what was possible despite racism, right? Because they saw women who were college educated. They saw women who had had other kinds of uh, activity, uh, opportunities and access in their life. But they also understood that these people were in the community to help them with such challenges as food and health insecurity, um, because they knew that politically viable, or, or sick people rather, could not be politically viable people, right? So they don't want people teaching African American farm laborers to vote, for example. Well, that's sort of, that's part of the end game. But what they also knew was that if you don't have any food in your belly, and a place to lay your head, you don't care about voting. Right? There are first and foremost bread and butter concerns um, that they need to, to deal with. Um, as you can see here in this slide, uh, black home demonstration clubs, like white home demonstration clubs, uh, were opportunities to learn about food preservation skills. Uh, they were spaces for women to gather to talk about important issues occurring in their communities and in the larger world. So one of the things that I talk about in this book, particularly after World War II, is how they talk about the post-war years. They talk about what the United Nations is doing. And this goes back to my point about not treating rural people as if they're ignorant, right? They're not. They're living a different reality, and that's it. It doesn't mean that they are, are um, unintelligent. <coughs> Now, Black Home Demonstration Inc. is also operated in multiple capacities. So this is an example here. Um, it flipped on the computer, but not up there. Not on the screen. So like, I, I can flip from one slide to the next on the computer, but it's not flipping on the screen. <coughs> <laughs> Mary at the top it looks like it What is it saying? Reconnect up there on the right. Or, or disconnect. Disconnect. So it must what it's saying is connected. Plugged in. It is plugged in. I'm just curious, uh, how many of us in this room have been involved ever in a home demonstration club? <laughs> yeah? Oh, no. <laughs> My mother got a 60-year reward, uh, an award for being a uh, home demonstration club for 60 years. <laughs> what about any of um, any? People, African Americans, have you ever had any experience in a home demonstration? Yes. 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 Well, there was yeah. always stuff at the Piper about the home demonstration clubs back in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. So. Yeah, and if there's not one at Dalton, 
Yeah, they, they still put an ad in the paper. I mean, I, 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 I think there's one that I'll Yeah, that's what the job is. Yeah. Yeah. Black women can't join those. 
So what they do is that in 1936, they established the State Council of Home Demonstration Clubs, and I'll just call that the SCHDC, again at Arkansas AM&N, known today as UAPB. But like its white, white counterpart, it created a network of home demonstration clubs around the state. And so what I have up here is a booklet from the Jefferson County Negro Home Demonstration Club. And there are just a couple of things that I just want to point out to you really quickly. If you notice there, it, it, uh, they have all the positions, right? Um, they've got a president, vice president, tr secretary, treasurer. One of their primary concerns is food and nutrition, right? So again, I go back to how we need to think about these women as, um, as being complicated <laughs> and nuanced. So yes, perhaps you are an agricultural laborer during the day, but at night you're the president of the home demonstration club, or the treasurer, or the parliamentarian. You hold a position that requires you to have some level of organization and intelligence, right? And these are spaces where those skill sets are um, appreciated. And so as I did this research, I spent a lot of time um, locating black women's activism and uncovering their stories in Arkansas state history, and particularly in Arkansas state histories that we really think we know something about. And I'm the sort of person who looks at a situation or a story, and I will own what I see, but I ask questions about what I don't see. And that's the stuff that I want to know about. And I just want to give you an example of what I mean here with this next slide. So again, I know you've heard of the Elaine Massacre, the 1919 Elaine Massacre, but if you haven't, I'll give you the backstory very quickly. African American farmers and members of the Progressive Farmers Household Union of America, the PFHUA, uh, this organization was incorporated in Winchester, Arkansas in 1918. They met at a church in Hoopsburg, Arkansas, down in Phillips County to demand their fair share of that year's cotton crop. That's important, right? Because we're not talking about black passivity, we're talking about black agency, autonomy, and activism, okay? Um, what happens next is, um, and, and, and let me also make this clear as well, the fact that they had organized and asserted their right to the fruits of their labor um, challenged the racial and economic status quo and the control that white landowners had over their labor force. And they're doing this at a time where we all know that people can very easily be killed for this, and some were, um, if you know how the story ends. <laughs> so black fight ensues between the members of this organization and Phillips County law enforcement officers. Um, men are arrested, and the men who are arrested eventually become known as the Elaine 12. So that's the story we know. Right, they go to jail, they're exonerated by 1923, and Neil Africanus Jones is involved. That's the story we know. But I ask other questions. Why would we imagine that only men were members of this organization? What about black women? What about women like, and this is just a flyer from that organization, but what about women like Cleola Miller? Right? Cleola Miller was a member of the Progressive Farmers Household, Household Union. Um, and I want to point out a few things about her. Um, she's married to someone who is a leader in the organization, but she's a member herself. She's invested in being a part of this organization herself. Um, that alone makes her a rural activist. But what I also found during the course of my research is her membership card in this organization. And again, a few things that I want to point out. She's about 24 years old when she's a member of this organization. She already has three children. She says she believes in God. When she was asked about her health, she said she was unhealthy, which was not uncommon among rural women, regardless of their race. But she's a member of this organization. And, and please keep in mind that we're talking about a time in our history where anything that challenges the racial, economic, gender status quo makes people incredibly uncomfortable. Right? I'm talking about this specific to Arkansas, but you can find situations like this all around the country um, at this point. But she's a member of this organization, and when this gunfire uh, ensues between officials and members of this organization, she <coughs> is among those African Americans who have to run for their lives. Women and children are among those who are shot and killed. And they initially arrested hundreds of people, some of whom were women, right? 
but you can see how the story has been distilled down to the point where they talk about the men who were arrested, but some of them uh, were women. Okay? Um, I want to move on to another example. What about the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, founded in Taronga, Arkansas in 1934? Once again, why do we assume that, the, all, that all the members were men? What about people like Eliza Nolden, who was a member of this organization and who died in 1938 after participating in a sharecropper strike? And after participating in this strike, she sued for $15,000 in damages after she was beaten and quite likely sexually assaulted by white landowners who were members of the East Arkansas Planters Group. Their activism matters. Black women's activism matters. It quite often cost them everything. In Cleola's case, when she tried to return to her home to collect her meager belongings, she found that they had been stolen. She saw them in white folks' houses, right? So it cost her everything she and her family had worked for. And it cost Eliza Nolden her life, all right? I want to now turn to talking about another group of women known as Jeans Supervising Industrial Teachers. And they were more commonly known as Jeans Teachers, and that's the term that I'm going to use. <laughs> These were black educators, most of whom were women, who were funded by an endowment left by this woman. Uh, this is Anna T. Jean. She's a white Quaker from Pennsylvania. And when she died in 1907, she left a million dollars. And I just want to be clear, that's a lot of money. Right? In 2021 dollars, it's about um, 20 to, 29 to 30 million dollars that she leaves for rudimentary black education when she dies in the rural south. And so Jean's teachers were responsible for basic reading, writing, and arithmetic. But they also perform and were expected to perform some of the same roles as home demonstration agents. But again, they too engaged in self-activism. This is just one image here that I wanted to um, show you very quickly. Um, if you take a look at this, what are they organizing here? They, they are organizing poultry, poultry clubs, um, pig clubs, but they're also concerned about the general welfare of the community, and they're traveling. Right? You can see here they travel about 11,251 miles, visit 100 schools, um, spend 10,000 hours on school work. They're doing some of everything. Right? They're doing some of everything in these um, communities. And they're working in rural environments often where schools didn't even exist for African Americans. Right? Um, and they help them build institution um, educational facilities or provided them with equipment when they lacked it in these educational uh, facilities. So their tasks and their responsibilities were many. Um, one example of these genes teachers was a woman named Annie Holland Curry. And Curry was born in Moralton and Conway County in 1885, educated at Shorter College in Little Rock. She returned to uh, Moralton to teach for a while, and she married W.L. Curry, who was a principal in the Mississippi County school system. And again, remember, the expectation is that they would teach them reading, writing, and arithmetic. They wanted them to learn rudimentary education, right? These landowners want them to learn basic skills. They don't want them to learn anything that's going to send them to Harvard or the University of Arkansas or someplace like that. They just want to make a better labor force, but not a labor force that's, that's going to leave. Um, but she's well known for her educational advocacy. So she's a member of the Arkansas Colored Teachers Association, the Mississippi County Negro Teachers Association. If you weren't aware, the PTA was segregated, right? Um, when we talk about the PTA, most people don't realize there's a whole history where the PTA was segregated well until the 1960s. And that's why you have the Arkansas Teachers, Color Teachers Association, the Mississippi um, Negro Teachers Association, the Arkansas Congress of Colored Parents and Teachers, right? Because they can't join the state organization, so they have to create their own. Okay? Um, and as I mentioned before, 
Jean's teachers, like home demonstration agents, are interested in healthcare activism in rural communities. So what kind of things are they involved in? They're involved in things like the National Negro Health Movement. And if you haven't heard about this before, I'll give you a little bit of background on that. This was founded by Booker T. Washington, who most people have heard of, right? Um, he was, a, he was a, a, a president of Tuskegee University in Alabama. He founded this in 1915 in reaction to the fact that African Americans nationwide, not just in rural spaces, had poor health outcomes. And this was one way for him to bring this to national attention, right? Um, and Jean's teachers, home demonstration agents, um, interracial coalitions within the community worked uh, with these folks. They all worked together to improve health outcomes among African Americans in rural communities. So this provides much needed health care access for African Americans. Um, rural health activism also included things like sexual health, and I'll get to that slide in just a second. But I just wanted to show you this really quickly, where you see here that in Blyville, Arkansas in 1930, because of National Negro Health Week, so there was a National Negro Health Movement, and then there was a National Negro Health Week, every April, right around Booker T. Washington's birthday. And this was an opportunity for you to get your teeth checked out, or to, to get that immunization if you needed it, because again, People didn't go to the doctors regularly like we do now, especially not farm people, right? So this was an opportunity, this community um, activity that galvanized several segments of the community, <coughs> provided African Americans with a, with a chance to get health care that they wouldn't normally get. But as I was saying, this also included sexual health, right? So Jean's teachers were familiar with organizations like the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, which in 1942 established a division of Negro service. And Jean's teachers in Arkansas reached out to this organization for birth control information. So if you look at the parts that I have circled in red there, you see where these Jean teachers are coming from. Ashley County, Bradley, Mississippi County, County Nevada County, which is in southwest um, Arkansas. Right? So again, these are the parts of discussions that they're having at churches, um, at home demonstration club meetings. So as I said before, it's not just about canning tomatoes. Right? It's about all of these other things that concern these people in their communities and in their families. Now the Jeans program lasts until 1968 throughout the South. We'll do the math on that. It lasts way after the Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court decision, but it only lasts until 1950 in Arkansas. And I think it ended when it did because of this woman, Isla Upchurch. And she was a Jeans supervisor in Nevada County, Arkansas. She was originally from Mississippi, I think she moved here in about 1925, lived the rest of her life in Arkansas, and you'll, you'll notice a theme with that, right? Some of these women come from other places, but spend the rest of their lives living um, in this state. She's also a, a graduate of Shorter College in Little Rock, <coughs> and she's a member of the Arkansas Congress of Colored Parents and Teachers. I mentioned that organization before, and in fact, in 1942, she was its president, but she was also a civil rights activist at a time when being involved in that kind of effort was dangerous. Right? She was um, an NAACP member. She was the NAACP Youth Council state chairperson. And because of this, by 1950, she had lost her job as a jeans teacher, right? So think back to the woman I mentioned, Sarah Daniels, back in South Carolina. Uh, although she was a home demonstration agent, it's pretty much the same reason why she lost her job, because she too was a civil rights activist, was a member of the NAACP, at a time when they were taking names and publishing them in the newspaper and punishing people for being members of these organizations. Now, I would be remiss 
since I'm here in Pocahontas at the Edie Mae Heron Center, if I did not at least give a nod to Edie Mae Heron. All right? And I have a disclaimer. She is not in my book. Not because she doesn't deserve to be, not because her works and her labors and her activism weren't substantial, but I was focusing on black women who labored in predominantly African American spaces. But she is more than worthy of a book. So if any of you got any free time on your hands, <laughs> you go ahead and write a book about her. Now, many of the men, women I've mentioned so far were members of the Arkansas Association of Colored Women. And in fact, Edie Mae Heron was a member of this organization. It would have been hard to find an African American woman in um, this state who wasn't a member of this organization. And this organization is important. It was founded in 1905, and it was a consortium of black women's clubs who were excluded from membership in the all-white Arkansas Federation of Women's Clubs. So there's the Arkansas Federation of Women's Clubs, the Arkansas Association of Colored Women. Right? So noticing, once again, that the reaction to segregation is for people to form their own organizations. And I'm going to refer to uh, that as the AACW. The AACW is affiliated with the National Association of Colored Women. That organization still exists today. In fact, the Arkansas Association of Colored Women still exists today. I'm a member. It's well over 100 years old um, at this point. And again, it consists of middle-class educated black women from all over the state. And their motto was lifting as we climb. And this organization's concerns were pretty much the same as home black home demonstration agents and jeans teachers. Health, food insecurity, homes, um, and children, right, because they are the next generation. So one of the AACW's primary objectives throughout the first few decades of the 20th century was to establish an industrial home for young black women. Why is this important? Because they have industrial homes for white girls. They have industrial homes for black boys, right? But if you're a young black girl once upon a time and you get convicted of a crime, you get sent to jail with hardened criminals. And you can read the newspapers. In fact, I wrote an article about this, about um, um, African-American women and criminality in um, Arkansas following World War I. When people talk about crimes like theft, we're talking about a 10-year-old girl who stole a piece of bread because she's housing insecure and she's starving, but they sent her to jail with hardened criminals. That kind of thing. This is the kind of issue that concern the members of the Arkansas Association um, of, colored, of Colored Women. And so this is just one example here in this article where these black club women in 1939 are so concerned about this young woman who's going to jail, so they say, you know, we're going to take care of her. We're going to make sure she's okay. We're going to make sure she gets what she needs because they know what a terrible situation she would be in if they sent her um, to jail. Because at this point, again, there is no industrial homework place for her to go uh, to be cared for. And this is something that they, they fight for for decades, right? They write letters to Arkansas governors asking for appropriations to build this kind of school for young black women. And the ones that exist for black, um, young black men and young, and young white women have been around like since the teens, the 19 teens. We don't get one for young black women until 1949. 1949, when the state legislature finally appropriated $25,000 to convert this institution, the Fargo Industrial School in Brinkley, Arkansas, um, into the Fargo Negro Girls <coughs> Training School. And even then, it only lasts for 20 years, right? Until about 1969, when it's absorbed, integrated into the white school. But for, however, for, for the time that it existed, and I think this is the big fat point, this is the long fought realization of the AACW's dream to provide a safe haven for indigent, housing insecure black women in Arkansas. They do this over the course of several decades until they get the appropriations they need. Now, I would like to end by talking about 
a rural black woman who's very much alive. And that is Annie Zachary Pike. Annie Zachary Pike was born Annie Ruth Davidson in 1931 in Big Creek in Phillips County. Um, she was educated at Trenton Elementary School. She was also later educated at a co-educational uh, school in Monroe County called the Consolidated White River Academy, from which she graduated in 1948. This is significant, right? Because when we think about co-educational boarding schools, we think about Phillips Exeter, Andover, places in the northeastern part of the United States. What a lot of people don't realize is that there were well over 100 co-educational boarding, African-American co-educational boarding schools that lasted until after the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision. And there were a few of them right here um, in Arkansas. Okay? Um, I'm going to refer to Annie Ruth Davidson as Miss Annie because if you go down to Phillips County to Marvel, where she lives now, that's what everybody calls her. So Miss Annie graduated, as I said, from Consolidated White River Academy and then went on to earn a nursing degree from the Homer G. Phillips Hospital School of Nursing in St. Louis, Missouri. This was a predominantly African-American institution because it was hard for African-American women to get training in predominantly white institutions. Um, she returns to Arkansas in 1952, and she married a man named Grover Cleveland Zachary, who was 13 years older than her. She was 30, he was 65. Who was a significant African-American landowner in Phillips County who has sharecroppers working for him, right? That's why I said some of these people are landowners themselves, right? Uh, a few months ago, I wrote an article about a man named Pickens Black in Jackson County, right, who at one point owned 10,000 acres of land when he died in 1955, had a whole town named after him called Blackville. These are not uncommon stories. We just don't hear about them. This is why we have to challenge these narratives. Now, after her husband becomes ill in 1962, he can't work anymore. Miss Annie takes over the farm operation. She works closely with black extension service agents. She challenges bankers who tried to cheat African Americans and had little fear of legal recourse. And she challenges them, right? She would, she would tell you, she would just say, why, why is my cotton not getting as much as somebody else's cotton or whatever? Right? She could do that in part because she was an independent landowner. <coughs> so she was a successful farmer, right? but she was also a community activist. And she said, and this is a quote, she was always interested in a better way of life for her people. So she was involved in the local and state home, black home demonstration organizations. She was also an active American Farm Bureau Federation member, which of course is the topic of my next book, and a member of the Arkansas Association of Colored Women. She also became involved in politics in the 1960s as a member of the Arkansas Republican Party. I'm going to let that sit for a second. <laughs> as a member of the Arkansas Republican Party, when she met this guy, anybody know who this is? Winthrop Rockefeller, right? New Yorker who moves to Arkansas. Millionaire, right? And she supported Rockefeller in his 1966 run for governor and when he became the first Republican governor since Reconstruction in 1967. And he rewarded Miss Annie. I mean, she was co-chair of the Republican Party, um, um, I guess, recruiting center or whatever, uh, the Republican Party committee in um, Phillips County, right? So she would literally go through these rural communities and tell people why you need to vote for Winthrop Rockefeller, why you need to vote Republican instead of Democrat. Right? This is what she's doing in these spaces at this point. And so when Winthrop Rockefeller becomes governor in 1967, he rewards her loyalty 
by making her, um, appointing her rather, to the Arkansas Welfare Board. And she stayed on that board well until like the 80s through several governors, right? Not only was she involved in Arkansas Republican Party politics, in 1972, Ms. Annie attended the Republican National Convention in Miami, Florida as the co-chairperson of the platform committee. Right, so she attended as, chair, as co-chairperson of the, of, the, of the platform committee. It's also while she's there that she attends the National Federation of Republican Women, where she was seated next to First Lady Pat Nixon and the wife of Vice President Spiro Agnew. And she gave a speech at this meeting. I have a copy of the speech. I have a copy of the program. Um, and she says, uh, she says this about her experience being a Southern black woman in the Republican Party. And this is a quote. I have definitely been a guinea pig in this race. But to make progress, someone has to make great sacrifices. I feel that it's time for women to realize this, come forward, and get involved in the affairs of our country, end quote. After attending the Republican Party convention that same year, this is 1972, Ms. Annie became the first African American to file and run for an elected position in 20th century Arkansas when she vied for a Senate seat. And this is a copy of that flyer for when she ran for that seat, right? And if you look on the other side here, it lists all of her qualifications. It talks about her being a member of um, home demonstration clubs. It talks about her being a member of the Arkansas uh, Farm Bureau Federation. It lists all her accolades in this flyer, right? And on this slide, just because I think this is really interesting, this is a copy of a little notebook, right? Uh, you can see at Annie Zachary, move Arkansas forward. She didn't win, but she didn't lose by that much. And I think that's important. She only lost by about 1,259 votes. And just because you're curious, I want you to see it for yourself. <laughs> and she remains involved in Arkansas Republican Party politics until about the mid-70s, really until just after Winthrop Rockefeller dies, right? But she remains involved. But her involvement include things like being vice president of the Arkansas Minority Republican Convention. Right? That's not a picture of that. Um, but I think it's important for you to know just how deeply entrenched she was in Arkansas Republican Party um, politics. Now, like all the women I've mentioned, Ms. Ann was deeply involved and interested in education. Uh, in 1979, she initiated the first National Teachers' Day. She was a longtime member of the Parent Teachers Association after it segregated, uh, desegregated rather, um, and also the American Education Association after it desegregated. Um, she was also a member appointed as a member of the White House Conference on Aging and just served way too many leadership positions uh, to name here. She's now in her early 90s. She's 90, 91 years old and just as sharp as a tack. And also, let me make this point to you uh, while I'm thinking about it. Um, she always makes it very clear that she was a Rockefeller Republican. <laughs> Lest you misunderstand. <laughs> she makes it clear. Um, <clears throat> In her early 90s, retired from most of her activities. But this rural black woman's activism is noteworthy because she influenced monumental change not only in Arkansas, but throughout the nation, right? So if you're talking about being on the White House Conference on Aging, that's not just Arkansas, that's a nationwide reach, okay? So how do we sum all of this up? in too many ways, but I'm going to just stick to three. Agrarian black women's identities are complex and multi-layered and have always been. Rural 
black lives do not exist apart from what was happening in Arkansas and around the nation. Rural people are not unaware, and as I've said numerous times throughout this talk, do not equate rurality with ignorance. Rural black women organized around the issues that were most important to them, that impacted their lives and their communities like women everywhere else. And in doing so, they paved the way for the next generation of black women activists who labored to ensure that African Americans could access better living by their own bootstraps in rural Arkansas. Thank you. I just want to point out that this is Miss Annie in um, the Arkansas Minority Republican <coughs> Organization. Um, and if anybody has any questions beyond our gathering this evening, please feel, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Yes. And I'm going to move around because I'm actually a hearing impaired person. So that helps me. Yes, sir. There are some, but not nearly as much as, not nearly as many as they were. I mean, once upon a time, they were all over the place. Yeah but not so much anymore. And I don't know that there are too many black women, rural black women involved in home demonstration clubs anymore. Um, I'm gonna say yes, they are, but I mean, it was a really, really big deal once upon a time. I mean, I spent a lot of time looking at extension service directors, even went to um, the archives in, in Texas. And I mean, what they were doing is just like, how do you do this? They're only 24 hours in a day. But, but you, you just don't see that much of it anymore. I suspect that when the extension service desegregated in the mid and late 1960s and home demonstration clubs desegregated, uh, the numbers dropped precipitously. In fact, if you um, read my book, again, you can get it at the University of Arkansas Press, just look up my name. Um, I have one story about um, a black home demonstration agent whom I interviewed before she passed, she was 95, and she said, uh, she was talking to some African American women years and years and years ago after desegregation. And she said, well, why aren't you going over here to meet with this group of people? And she said, they said, we got this letter about meeting and we're going to do X, Y, and Z, but we knew that didn't mean us, right? So just because it's desegregated doesn't mean that you feel welcome. You, you desegregated, but some of these customs remain. So it's hard for people to, to gather because of uh, past history, but um, I suspect that, I mean, yes, there are some black women who are still working for the extensive service, but like it was 50 years ago, no, no. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to say that I attended these meetings since I was born like this, mm -hmm. um, but our rural area now has changed so much because we don't have, we used to have like 80 acre farms and we don't have that anymore. So, so many of those ladies either they're, they moved into town like my mother and daddy did and, and when I drive out to our farm, none of the stuff that used to be there was there. None of the people that used to be there. Um, so I think, you know, that was one reason why that has kind of um, you know, gone by the wayside, I guess. Uh, and, and I was thinking too, I was trying to think of some of the media which of course, um, I can only imagine as a black woman the difference in what your what their meetings would be like mm -hmm. as to opposed to what my mother was being you know, it's like teaching you how to make a hat. Mm -hmm. or, <laughs> but they did that too. Yes, but what I'm saying, I feel like that my mother and her generation <coughs> just were complete. And I don't mean that to be, they didn't, they didn't have the same issues that <coughs> I had to <coughs> But 
course is. Because I've done some research on this for another, pro for another project. They have issues too, right? Yes. Like birth control access. Yeah. Right? Um, like, and, and seriously, I mean, I've started writing a paper about this. I'll get back to it with the other things that I'm working on. Um, they're writing and asking about birth control creams and, and saying, but don't tell anybody. Yeah. You know, this will happen. Um, or I'll be censored in the community. So, so they are having those kinds of conversations. And I think there are conversations that are common to poor, rural women, regardless of race. Um, if you, you may not have to be, be worried about you know, racism, but you do have to worry about sexism. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's a different set of problems, I would say. Yeah. For my mother, it was a day that she didn't have to work on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, because yeah. there were there were a few opportunities to, to socialize, and I think you know if you're living in some sort of isolated place, regardless of race, those opportunities are important. And I also want to say this: when we think about race relations and Jim Crow laws or whatever, we got to be careful because that looks different in different spaces. Right? I mean, rural Jim Crow looks very different from urban Jim Crow, right? Because you have to think about the fact that in rural communities, people really need each other. And if there's an emergency or a crisis, you don't care who's helping you as long as you get help. Yeah. And, and things tend to be a bit more relaxed unless there's a crisis, right? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, it is very obvious, I think, from what you've said that uh, those women played an incredibly important role in those communities. And I, but I think about a place like our community here, where with a smaller number, mm -hmm. as far as I know, we didn't have African American women involved in such organizations. Mm -hmm. Not that we didn't need it. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered, was there anything here that would have Fill that role that you've come across in your research? Um, not anything as particular to focus on simply because Church. I wasn't looking for it. What I do Church. know is that in instances in communities in Arkansas that were predominantly white that had very small black communities, sometimes white home demonstration agents would work with them. Now what that means and what that actually looks like, I don't know. Um, but I think there were some attempts to provide them with some services. I have something to say about that. I don't necessarily agree because I can remember when the lady came from Jonesboro. I can't remember her name, but she, almost everybody here had gardens. So they were teaching them how to can in, how to use the pressure cooker. Because I remember when my mother got her first pressure cooker. <laughs> and she was so excited because she would have to do all that work and it made it, made it easier for her. And I can remember them coming in and teaching teaching them of. And I can remember when we had the PTA here. And that everybody was so excited because they came, they were involved in what we were doing at school and pulling in other parents here that didn't have children. They were they were allowed to be a member of the PTA too. So it was, it was something really different. Right. And a lot of these women, and again, this is true regardless of race, they were involved in home demonstration clubs, but they were really involved in 4-H. And, and I, I'm even old enough to remember the 4-H. Um, and a lot of what they did with the 4-H was to give their children the opportunity to do things they couldn't do. So like, for example, a lot of these women sold goods at current markets, right? Um, to supplement the family income and to also make sure that their kids could go to college if they wanted to, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing my grandmother did. Um, she did that to make sure my mother could go uh, uh, to college. So um, it served many purposes. And, and I have to say that these women, though they had limited education, they were very intelligent and, and they had incredible foresight. They imagined futures for their children that they could never that they knew they would never experience themselves. Um, and I and I think that's 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 pretty powerful for you to imagine a future that you can't even really understand, but you know that it'll be something better for your, your children and your grandchildren than it was than it was for you. But do uh, do y'all feel like that it made it better or 
gorgeous. Feel the same? Or, or, I'm sorry. Do you feel like it has made it better? Uh, uh, for, for the people back in their days and the kids now. I, 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 I think a lot of times that depends on who you ask. I would tell you this. My grandmother cleaned houses for a living, and I'm a dean. Yeah. There you so go. I think it's that. <laughs> <laughs> For me and my folks, it's that. <laughs> I'd much rather be Dean. <laughs> From what I see, our younger people, they, they say this for me. I don't know. I'm just asking. I mean, and, and you may be right. It, you know, to me, it's sort of like music, right? And how when I was a teenager, my parents needed my music. <laughs> but you know who hated uh, James Brown in the 60s? My grandmother. <laughs> and so on and so forth. You know what I'm saying? I mean, every, every generation has that thing where they think the next generation is, is lacking something. Um, but I, I mean, I, I do think and believe that there's more opportunity for each subsequent generation. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, my grandmothers never could have imagined that their grandchildren would do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It just, it just wasn't in the realm of possibilities mm -hmm. for them growing up in the Jim Crow South. And my grandmother on my maternal side had a sixth grade education. That was a big deal mm -hmm. back then. And my maternal grandmother didn't even have that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think things are tremendously better for us. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> 